So scientists use X-ray crystallography to, uh, to study the crystals and figure out what the arrangements are. When we talk about a crystalline lattice, we're referring to the regular arrangement of atoms within a crystalline solid. Crystalline salt. Salt. Thank you. Didn't see that yesterday. Rice with herpes. Rice with herpes? Herpes, yeah. Nice. Guessing Yeah, well, it's just, you know, it, it flipped over. It's just upside down. Thank you. Okay. So, um, the particles in the crystal are going to arrange themselves to minimize their energy. Um, so, we've got this ginormous lattice, and the way we look at this is we look at the smallest piece that is the repeating unit, and that's called the unit cell. So here's a two-dimensional lattice, so much easier to look at. Um, the smallest repeating unit would be from the center of this sphere to the center of that one and over here. If you take that and you repeat it over and over and over again, you get the lattice. Okay. It's a little bit like mosaic tiles or something in a bathroom. So these circles are representing the lattice points. That, those are the points that would be occupied by an atom, an ion, or a molecule. And this is the lattice square. The, I mean, the, the unit cell is this dark square. Any questions? There are many types of unit cells. And here, an illustration of, of them. So, you know, there's monoclinic, triclinic, tetra tetragonal, orthorhombic, etc. And they vary, the difference between them is what the angles are at the corners and how long the sides are. We're going to look at cubic unit cells. In a cube, the length of each side, length, width, and height are all the same, and the angles are all 90 degrees. Uh, you can have a rhombohedral, which is like a cube, but it's tweaked, it's twisted, right? So the angles aren't 90 degrees, but the sides are the same length. Or you can have tetragonal where all the angles are 90 degrees, but the sides are not the same length. All kinds of variations on them. No. I'm just showing this, uh, you know, you may have heard of some of these terms before, um, and th this is just what they mean, just more for your interest. We're going to look at three cubic cells and one hexagonal cell. Oh, wait, I do both. What's the three hexagonal and tetragonal? Um, it's a little hard to tell on, on this graph, on this table here, but for this one, we've got a 120 degree angle. So this angle right here, this guy, is 120 degrees, and up here, they're all 90. Yeah, more of a diamond shape. Yeah. No, that's okay. So we're going to look at unit cells, and we're going to have some pictures, and they're going to have different colored balls, but those are all representing the same kind of atom. We're just using different colors to help us visualize. We're not meaning that there's two different kinds of atoms. Uh, we talk about a coordination number and packing efficiency. The coordination number is... You look at one atom and you say, how many other atoms is this atom in direct contact with? And that's important because those are the atoms that that atom interacts strongly with, is the neighboring ones. Um, packing efficiency is the percentage of the volume of the unit cell that's actually occupied by spheres, by atoms, ions, or molecules, as opposed to being empty space. And these, these two numbers correspond a high coordination number um, gives a greater packing efficiency. So these are three um, cubic cells. There's simple cubic, body-centered cubic, and face-centered cubic. Um, the coordination numbers are different. We've got 6, 8, and 12. And then the packing efficiencies increase as the coordination numbers increase. We're going to look at each of these separately. So the first one is the simple cubic unit cell. So we have 
one atom at each corner of this cube. The atoms are going to touch on their edges, and so if we want to know the length of each side, which we call L, it's going to be one radius plus another radius. So the length of the sides of this cube are 2R. Depends on how big the atom is, right? Larger atom, larger unit cell. The other thing we're interested in is how many atoms are in this unit cell? Well, there's parts of eight atoms in there, one at each corner, right? But if we took these pieces and pulled them apart and reassembled them, it would make one atom. Each of these is one-eighth of an atom, and there's eight of them. So there's one atom, the equivalent of one atom, in the unit cell. Does that make sense? Yes? No? Yes, yes thank you. So it, we'll go for it. Makes sense to one person, so on we go. The rest of you are out of luck. Here's another way to look at that. That's the picture we were just looking at. And so here it is with all of the atoms intact, the full atoms. But the unit cell goes from the center of each of these atoms. So it's got one-eighth of each of those atoms in it. Uh, we can look at the coordination number here by looking at this atom here on the edge of one unit cell. And it's in contact with one, two, three, four, five, six other atoms directly touching. So it's directly touching three in its unit cell, and then it is also part of other unit cells, and so it's touching atoms in those unit cells as well. This has a packing efficiency of 52%. 48% of that is empty space. Not very efficient. Questions? So here we have a two-dimensional lattice, and it asks us to calculate the packing efficiency of, of this two-dimensional lattice. And so they drew a unit cell in here for us. Well, packing efficiency, that's a percentage. What is it? It's kind of a universe. Well, it's a ratio. It's a part over the whole okay. times 100, right? It's a percentage. So it's packing efficiency is how much of the cell is occupied by an atom as opposed to empty space, right? How much is the atom over how much is the whole volume? So the packing efficiency is going to be, in this case, it'll be area because this is two-dimensional. The area of the atoms divided by but the total area of the cell. Total area of the unit cell. Okay, so we're looking at in this square the area that's purple divided by the whole area. And then times 100 to get a percentage. If it was all purple, it'd be 100%. If it was all white and empty, it'd be 0%. Somewhere in between. How do we calculate the total area? Length times width, right? So here we have, I'm going to draw it down here. Do you count? Oh, just so we're just going to look at one cell. Oh, that's okay. We're not going to look at the whole thing because, I mean, you could look at the whole thing, but the unit cell is the same percentage as the whole thing. So in this unit cell, what, what do we typically call the radius of an atom? What letter? R, right? R for radius. So if we say that's the radius, then the length of the side is 2R. And what's the area of the whole square? 2R times 2R, right? So we've got 2R times 2r, or 2r the quantity squared. And then we want to know how much of this is occupied by the atoms. Well, how many atoms, how many spheres, circles, are in this square? One. 
you could do a fourth of four, but if you cut this out and put them together, these four pieces would make a circle, right? They're each a quarter circle. So what's the area of one circle? Pi r squared. So the area of atoms is going to be pi r squared, because there's one atom in that square, right? Everybody still with me? Sort of. Times 100%. Well, if I rearrange this, uh, 2r times 2r would be 4r squared, right? And the r squareds cancel out. And so we end up with pi over 4 times 100, which yesterday my calculator couldn't deal with. I don't think it's in radians. It, it shows me. It shows me 25 pi. Yeah. Like no, I want to know what pi times 25 is, and it just will not do it. I'm sure there's something I'm missing. But 78.5. 78.5. Thank you. So 78.5 percent. So the packing efficiency for this two-dimensional lattice is 78.5 percent. Any questions? Yeah, this is two-dimensional. This is three-dimensional. If it was three-dimensional, yeah, you'd have to look at volumes. So the volume would be the length cubed, and the volume of the sphere would be four-thirds pi r. I mean, pi. Yeah, pi r cubed. But it's the same idea. The next unit cell is a body-centered cubic. So this is like you took that uh, simple cubic cell and you moved the edges out a little bit and made room for an atom in the middle. This gold atom here is the same kind of atom as the purple one. It's just if they're all purple, it just looks like a big old mess and we can't see what we're looking at. So here we have the atoms are not touching along the length of a side. So this is larger than 2r, but how much? Well, they are touching diagonally through the cube. So from this corner to the opposite diagonal corner of the cube, they're touching. And so you have to use the Pythagorean theorem, and you blah, 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 and you end up with the length of the side is 4r over the square root of 3. You, you might need to use this here in the box. I would give that to you because I have a hard time remembering it myself. That's kind of my, my uh, gauge is if I can't remember it, I don't expect you to remember it. Only other professors <laughs> Maybe they have better memories than I do. Okay, so there's the cutaway version. Here it is with the intact atoms. And here we're blowing it up a little so we can see the coordination number. Here, this purple atom at the corner is in direct contact with eight atoms now, not just four. I mean, not six, not just six. The packing efficiency goes up. It's 58% now. There's less empty space. Any questions? So we could do a problem like this. An atom has a radius of 138 pico <laughs> picometers and crystallizes in the body-centered cubic unit cell. What's the volume of the unit cell in cubic centimeters? Well, the length of a side is... 4r over the square root of 3. Did I do that right? I'm trying to remember that. That's for the body-centered cubic. And so then the volume would equal the length cubed. Right? So that's 4r over the square root of 3 
that whole quantity raised to the third power. There's only one variable in there. It's r. They give us r. r equals 138 picometers. We could plug that in and calculate the volume, and what would the unit be of the volume? Cubic picometers. But what does the question ask us for? Cubic centimeters. So you can calculate cubic picometers and then convert it to cubic centimeters. Um, I prefer to just convert picometers to centimeters and then stick it in the equation. So there's different ways you can do this. This is my favorite way. I'm just going to rewrite this 138. Instead of writing P for pico, I'm going to write what pico means. Pico means 10 to the what? Negative 12. Nano is minus 9. So it's that many meters. And then converting meters to centimeters is much easier. So centimeter on top, meter on the bottom. One centimeter is 1 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. Some of you are still doing this backwards and telling me that 100 centimeters, I mean 100 meters is 1 centimeter. It's like telling me that an inch is 12 feet. Not quite. So the meters cancel out. And you could do this on your calculator, but you can also do it in your head. And it is 138 times 10 to the minus 10 centimeters. That's not proper scientific notation, but this is just me showing my work, so it doesn't matter. It'll be fine. So I'm going to plug that in here. 4 times 138 times 10 to the minus 10 centimeters divided by the square root of 3, the whole thing raised to the third power. So on my calculator, I'm going to do, I'm going to open the parentheses and go 4 times 138 times EE minus 10 divided by the square root of 3. I have to move the cursor over to get out from under the square root symbol. Close the parentheses um, and then raise that to the minus 3 power and press enter. This should have three sig figs, so we're going to call this 3.09 times 10 to the 22nd. I did something wrong. Oh, I raised it to the negative 3 power. It's to the third power. Good grief. Oh, that's better. 3.24 times 10 to the negative 23rd cubic centimeters. We expect this to be a very small number. Any questions? I forgot to point something out here when we were talking about this body-centered cubic cell. This cell contains two atoms now. We've got the same eight corners that we had before. Eight times one-eighth is one. And then we have that gold one in the middle, a whole atom. So there's two atoms in there. Then we have the face-centered cubic. So here, instead of that extra atom being centered in the body of the unit cell, um, it's centered on, on the faces. So we have um, an atom centered on each face. So we've got a total of six faces. Each of those is half of an atom. So that's three atoms plus the one sp split up around the corners. So this one has four atoms in it. And then to find the length of the side, again, those corner ones are not touching. But now we do have touching from the corner of one face to the diagonal other diagonal corner. And so this is R and 2R and another R. So we've got 4R is, is the uh, hypotenuse of that right triangle.
and you end up with 2 square root of 2 times r. So L equals the 2 square root of 2 times the radius. The things I have to deal with. At least they don't use the, um, the leaf blower up here on the second floor like they did when I was lecturing in the basement. Right outside my door. So again, there's the cutaway version. Here's the full version. You see, this is getting a little difficult to look at, isn't it? To see what's going on. That's why we cut it up like this. And then in here, um, good luck, but you should be able to figure out that there's uh, 12. So this guy right here is actually in contact with 12 other atoms. So the coordination number is 12, and the packing efficiency is 74%. Questions? Another calculation problem. 74? Did I do that wrong? 68. 68 and then 74. Okay, chromium crystallizes in a body-centered cubic unit cell. The radius of a chromium atom is 125 picometers. Calculate the density of solid crystalline chromium in grams per cubic centimeter. Yeah. Yeah. It makes more sense this time. Because grams per cubic centimeter is a typical unit for uh, density. OK, so how do you even think about this problem? You don't. If you want to pass the class, you need to. Well, what's density? That's a place to start. Density equals mass divided by volume. We're looking at a body-centered cubic unit cell. Do we know what the length of a side of that cube is in terms of the radius of the atoms? Yeah, we do. The length is 2. No, that's... I did this yesterday, too. It's body-centered, not face-centered. It's 4r over the square root of 3. They showed us a new thing and gave us a problem relating to the one before. Why would it fly? To get me. They broke it, it's, it's a vendetta against me. And I'm not paranoid. paranoid. Did you show them? No. <laughs> but I screwed up yesterday. I caught myself before I finished the problem, but I did screw up. So it's 4r over the square root of 3. Body-centered cubic unit cell. The radius of the chromium atom is 125 picometers. So R equals 125 picometers. Is that a good unit for doing all these calculations? No, we'd like that in centimeters. So instead of, uh, instead of picometers, I'll do what I did before. I'm going to write times 10 to the minus 12 meters and convert that to centimeters. and come up with 125 times 10 to the minus 10 centimeters. So I have what I need to calculate the volume, right? The volume is 4r over the square root of 3 cubed, just like that previous problem, but with different numbers. So we can plug this into the calculator again, see if I can do it right this time. 4 times 125 times 10 to the minus 10 divided by the square root of 3 raised to the third power. And so this would have three significant figures, but since this is not the final result. I definitely don't want to round it off yet, so I'm going to carry two extra digits. And then that's times 10 to the minus 23rd uh, cubic centimeters. That's the volume. So we have our density equation up there. We're going to put that in the denominator, 
times 6 times 10 to the minus 23rd cubic centimeters. Now we need the mass. The mass of a body-centered cubic unit cell of chromium. What? How many atoms are in the cubic unit cell here? Two. Two. Could we figure out how much two atoms weigh? Well, if we took the molar mass of chromium times 2, that would be the mass of 2 moles. So molar mass of chromium divided by Avogadro's number multiplied by 2? Yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, I didn't plan this out very well, so I need more space, so I'll erase that up there. So we have two atoms of chromium. We know the mass of one mole. It's um, 51.9961, 51.9961 51 grams. That's the mass of one mole, but we only have two atoms. Well, how many atoms are in a mole? 6.022 times 10. Yeah, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So what if instead of writing mole, I wrote 6, <laughs> that was bad. Oh, what's, pardon me while I fix, try to fix, come on. I don't know what I'm doing. The computer is lagging behind me. It's very disconcerting. So instead of writing moles in the bottom, I'm going to write the number of atoms in one mole, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So atoms cancel, and that gives me the mass in grams of two atoms. So 2 times 51.9961 divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd equals another very, very small number. Uh, 1.7 to 6, 8, 7, times 10 to the minus 22 grams. I used the full molar mass given on the periodic table. Avogadro's number here only has four sig figs. Two atoms, though, is, is an exact number. So this mass has four sig figs. 1.72687. Times 10 to the minus 22 grams. So I take that mass and I divide by the volume. And out of all those crazy numbers, I come up with this. Doesn't that just kind of seem like a miracle of some, some sort? 7.18. Is that a reasonable density for a metal? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. Water has a density of one. Metals are more dense. Seven. Very reasonable. Any questions? If the chromium crystallized in a different cubic <coughs> unit cell, the density would be different. Because the density has the, the mass of the atoms divided by the area that they take up. A simple cubic unit cell has less efficient packing. There's more empty space, and so the density would be less. Any questions? So another way to think about crystal structures is to imagine stacking layers of spheres, okay? And this would be a good use for all those marbles I found under the refrigerator. You can take a small box and use marbles or any other sphere, tennis balls or baseballs or whatever you have laying around, and you can actually play around with this at home and see how many you can stack in a box. So here what we're doing is we're looking at layers. So here I've got one, two, three layers in here. This is a representation of the simple cubic unit cell. So 
here I have one sphere, and in the next layer, that sphere is exactly on top of it. And these spheres are in a nice square arrangement. There's lots of empty space here, though. It's actually hard to get marbles or spheres to stack that way because they want to fall down into the little divots. More efficient packing is when you offset the rows by half of an atom. So what we were looking at before is more like this. You see the difference? So here we've got rows this way that are straight lines of atoms, and rows this way that are straight lines of atoms. Or they're trying to be straight lines. Here, when we go up and down, we have a straight line of atoms. But when we go across, it's staggered. So they're shifted a little bit, and that allows them to get closer together. It's more efficient. Okay. So in the closest pack structures, we're going to have layers of this sort of an arrangement. So there's layer A, and then we have options in terms of how we put layer B on top of it. So we could put layer B so that it's sitting directly on top of layer A, but it really would rather not do that. It's, it's more likely to be offset half of an atom to the left and half of an atom down so that each of these balls is sitting in the little indentation left in the lower level. Does that make sense? So that's what a closest pack structure is. Uh, we're going to look at two of them. Um, hexagonal closest packed is, is where we have the third layer. The third layer is where the difference comes in. The first layer and the second layer are the same for each of these. The third layer is different. So here the, the third layer is the same as the first layer. So this red one is directly above that one. And so this is an ABAB pattern, and this is called hexagonal closest packed. We've got the third layer aligned with the first layer. Both of these closest pack structures have a packing efficiency of 74% and a coordination number of 12. It's just the third layer arrangement that is a little different. Here the unit cell is hexagonal. It's not a cube. And the difference, again, is, is the angle of one of those sides. So. Here we have a look at, at how this is. So right here we have the unit cell. And this angle here is 120 instead of 90, like it is in the simple cubic. And then we've got this guy in here as well. If you put um, three of those together, it looks like a hexagon. So that's hexagonal closest path. Cubic closest pack is where that third layer is, um, is offset from the first layer. So we have an A, B, C pattern, and then it re repeats again A, B, C. This is exactly the same as the face-centered cubic unit cell. It's just a different way of looking at it. So here is that face-centered cubic unit cell we looked at earlier. This is looking at it in terms of stacking layers. Here's the first layer. The second layer is offset. The third layer is offset from the first layer, and then the fourth layer is the same. You put those together, tip them on their side, chop them up, and you get that. This has the same packing efficiency and the same coordination number as the hexagonal closest packed, but it's not the exact same arrangement of atoms. The angles are different. So any questions about unit cells? Good.